Sonika Rishi Das, I am director of the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies, is in a jolly mood this evening. <laughs> Can you tell us something about why it is there's a Bhagavad Purana research project at the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies? Since the beginning of the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies, we thought it was very important to have a, a, a Bhagavad Purana project because there has been no academic project to really study this. Individual scholars have done wonderful work, but really to get into the, pro the Bhagavad Purana from a multidisciplinary point of view, it's a massive work itself. It has so many commentaries uh, in Sanskrit and in the vernacular, but also it's had such a huge influence on Indian culture uh, in terms of art and music and dance and poetry and even architecture, philosophy, uh, theology, economics, politics, Bollywood. How they represent religion is to do with festivals and pujas and etc. So the, the, the Bhagavad has had a huge influence, but really we haven't looked into it to see, well, what's there? The influence is to this day, you have huge Bhagavad Katas um, in India, in Australia, in North America, in Europe, in, what's in a kata? Dubai. A Kata is a, a seven day recitation of the Srimad Bhagavatam, mm. uh, with thousands of people come. So this, uh, for instance, in England, it is without doubt the most popular uh, Hindu text because of the Katas. That's where everyone learns uh, the stories. Mm. Um, so you know, we say, what's your Bible, the Bhagavad Gita? But in actual fact, for most, it's, it's the Bhagavad Purana. Um, so, so not to study it would be practically sinful. <laughs> you know, we really need to understand this text um, mm. very deeply. It's, it's a profound literature you know, in terms of its poetry and how the poetry has been constructed around philosophy and theology and how it's uh, uh, inspired so many people to take that and then go into the world and do something with it. So it, ha it hasn't been part of the Brahminical traditions in the sense of uh, confining it to one group. It's mm. everyone has taken it and done something with it, uh, every class of person. So it's wonderful like that, but so we really have to study it mm. to understand India and to understand Indian culture and Indian thought in the modern world. When you say not confined to any class or group, um, yet we tend to identify it with Hindu tradition, and yet now it seems that it's been migrating beyond uh, boundaries of what we usually think of as Hinduism. Mm. Uh, what can we say about that? What is going on there? Well, I, I really think that the, you know, um, Groups, groups will take the Bhagavad and say, this is our Bhagavad. But then another group is going to take the Bhagavad and say, this is our Bhagavad. That's what's been happening ever since we've, we've known about the Bhagavad Purana. Yeah. Everyone takes it and appropriates it onto themselves and say, this is my Bhagavad. And everyone's interpreting it in their own way. So the fact that it goes into other traditions, I would be very interested to see if it actually goes into Christianity and people start to develop Bhagavad traditions within Christianity and interpretations through dialogue with Hinduism. Well, we just talked with Noel Shaith about that. Uh -huh. He has interesting ideas. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and I think, I think any, anyone from any tradition who encounters it will start to have ideas about how to appropriate it, as everyone in India has done. Because it's, it's Vaishnavs, it's a Vaishnav text, it's a Bhakti text, but the Shaivites have it, yeah. the Advaitins have it, everyone has it. Yeah, yeah. So we, we can't limit it. And that's, right. that's the interesting thing about it. It's, uh, it's so broad yeah. that everyone finds themselves in it. Yeah. And so not to study a text like that would be silly, yes. simply. Now, one practical reason why we haven't studied it before is because it's so big, um, four, 14 and a half thousand verses, uh, and then you have, to, you have to translate that, and then you have to translate all the commentaries, the hundreds of commentaries, yeah. and then you have to go into the vernacular languages like Bengali and Punjabi and, and uh, Gujarati and Marathi and Tamil and Telugu, Malayalam, you know, it's a huge job. And then within those traditions, you've got their philosophies, their theologies, their, their dance and music, etc., and, and their art and, and, and uh, uh, poetry. So, you know, it's just so vast. Why would anyone take it on? Who would be so foolish? We are so foolish. <laughs> <laughs> and you personally, I believe, have also been reading the Bhagavata Purana for many years. Indeed I have. Would you say you have a favorite episode or a section of the Bhagavata? Is that a fair question? Anything um, you'd like to it's, it, Actually, I have thought about this myself. Mm -hmm. um, 
on a number of occasions and it's usually the part I'm reading at that time. Oh, I see. <laughs> and then I read it and then I go back again and it says, yeah. no, no, it's this one. <laughs> so I've never, I've never really come to a conclusion. But I must say, every evening I read the 10th canto. Oh. Um, and I read a story, oh. you know, a particular section of that. So, so even though intellectually I haven't come to a conclusion, right. my heart has gone elsewhere. <laughs> my, I, I've, I've voted with my feet on this, and it seems to be the 10th canto, canto, whether I like it or not. <laughs> Which is uh, not unusual for the tradition. No, 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 because it's the stories of Krishna, and right. I just like Krishna. Yeah. And the other stories are great, and when you read them, it's like it's so multifaceted and you read so much into it, but just when you read about Krishna, it just does something to the heart, and that's it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any favorite verses you have? Um, well, one verse that I keep on coming back to, and it's, it's kind of a simple verse. It's, a, it's, an, it's at the beginning, it's in the uh, second chapter. It's, uh, uh, and that was one of the first verses that actually struck me about uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam. And it's um, the, the supreme occupation, dharma, or religion you could say, or it's bad, bad translation, the supreme occupation for all humanity is that by which one can attain loving devotional service unto the su supreme transcendent Lord. And and the thing that got me was such service must be unmotivated and uninterrupted in order to completely satisfy the self. And what I loved was unmotivated and uninterrupted to find love. And that's what I was looking for. Yeah. And it, it meant that it wasn't, it wasn't, it was a selfless love. Mm. I, I can't go to my girlfriend with, with uh, flowers and chocolates and expect a return on the investment. Right. So who, who can I love like that? Yeah. And then the final one, yayatma supersedati, the atma, must be completely satisfied. So what it said was, you must, if you must become happy by this process. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for happiness. Right. So it was like, they understand my desire. <laughs> <laughs> so you this, got it. Yeah, yeah. They're not saying, give up this, give up this, give up this. They say, no, no, no. The whole point of this is, you have to become happy. Mm -hmm. Do you want happiness? There you go. This is how you do it. So I, I really, in terms of a definition of, of religion or spirituality, it was very comprehensive, very open, very broad-minded. I really liked it. So I, so I just found it very applicable to me as an Irishman at the time. And, and my quest actually was to become a Christian. So I was looking for a definition of love of God because that's a, a Christian quest. And this is where I found it, <laughs> I just ironically. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. So it, it helped me become a Christian. That was, that was the point. There's a lot, I find a lot of uh, sense of wonder, wonder in the Bhagavatam. <coughs> sort of the wonder of creation, mm. uh, the wonder of uh, Yashoda looking in the mouth of Krishna and seeing the whole world inside his mouth and so on. Um, do you get that also? Oh yeah. Of... yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, well. Maybe I'm looking at different wonders, yeah. but uh, the wonder uh, of Krishna—he's uh, a butter thief. So God's a thief. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I just like that. I just like the fact that he's a rascal, uh. and he's a butter thief. And it's a beautiful picture that I've seen, where he's putting the butter into his mouth, but he's staring out of the picture, uh. and. Uh, I remember when I first saw it, it struck me that actually I don't really love God, I envy Him <laughs> because He always gets away with it. <laughs> I don't, when I steal butter, I never got away with it <laughs> or anything. But uh, He just smiles and He's just so beautiful and everything about Him is good. Huh. And when He steals the butter, the That's gopis cool. who churn the butter, they get annoyed for five seconds and then they fall in love with Him again. And they bring Him to His mother to chastise Him, but she can't because she falls in love with Him because it's so cute. And uh, that never happened to me. <laughs> so, so I realized that, in a sense, we all want to be God. We all want to be this person who's totally loved. And I just find that so wonderful that we have a story about a person like this. Mm. This really is God. That, and, yeah. and the Bhagavata says that the qualification for reading the Bhagavata is to be near Matsara, to be free from envy. Um, that could be a discouragement. One might think, okay, then I'm not qualified to read it. Well, there's no doubt that I'm not qualified to read it. <laughs> make make the, no bones about the fact. But to be free from envy um, means to be full of love. 
Yeah. And what the Bhagavatam, as I said, to go back to the first verse, for kind of first principles, I found out what love was. Right. Mm -hmm. So then I could do something about it. Yeah. So, the, so the you know what you're trying to do. Exactly. You exactly. It. It, but that verse made it practical. Yeah. Because it, it said that love was devotional service. It was something that you do. Right. It was a verb. So and so I can do something. There's always something you can do, and that made everything possible. So there's always a little thing that I can do to just advance myself. So no, I'm not free of envy, but I'm not full of envy. Right. Yeah. And that's that's good enough for now. Yeah, that's <laughs> a good start. It's a good start. There's a an Irish saying, "Tuas mah latna hibra." A good start is half the work. Wow. <laughs> on that, on that Irish aphorism, I think we can end. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You.